Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 534. I'm Gavin Coulson. I'm George Conger. And I'm Gavin Ashenden. And this is the 17th of September, 2019. And uh, it's a day when we celebrate Hildegard of Bingen, who saw herself as a feather on the breath of God. The three of us are a little bit too heavyweight to see ourselves as feathers, but we hope nonetheless to be driven by the breath of God. Okay, people, at least we're hoping you're fans of the show that you like watching this. We do have our critics, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Before we get started, as faithful viewers, we need you to do a couple things. We want you to like like this product you're watching. This is a great show. It's fun to do. We sit down and we have a, a wonderful pre-show. We laugh and laugh and laugh, and then we try to get serious once we hit the record button. You're, you're seeing us at our most serious state. So if you could like the program, if you could comment on the program, we're getting 80 to 100 comments per episode. That's wonderful. That's where the conversation continues. Also, you need to subscribe to this program. You want to know when the next one's coming right out. You click on the YouTube subscribe button, and then there's a little bell that comes up. I don't know why it's a two-step process, but with YouTube, they want it's a two-step process. You see that little bell, you click it, and you'll get instant notifications the next time there's an episode. Also, if you see us on Facebook, share us around. We don't mind being shared. We understand that you're not the only person who wants to watch us, and uh, it's okay to share us. Gentlemen, have you had a fun week? George, you had a fun week. What did you do yesterday? Oh, I had a colonoscopy. <laughs> and uh, we were debating. I was asking uh, Kevin if, uh, and Gavin if our viewers would like to see the photos uh, <laughs> taken by the gastroenterologist. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, that's all done. And no, we'll, George, I we don't have to go back for three years. Part of this show is shining the light in the darkness. So it, it only makes sense. Gavin, what are you been doing this week? <laughs> um, I, I, see, I think I spend my time writing, praying, and traveling. <laughs> so good. good. Um, so I've, I've, I've been doing all that. I'm, I'm very glad to be home now and uh, catching up on all the things. Uh, in fact, I, I decided I'd better do a troll through my emails. Um, with emails, I, I I I read them. I try and reply straight away. If I can't reply straight away, I flag them. And then uh, today, I went back through all my flagged emails to discover how many I hadn't replied to. So if, if there's anybody out there who's written to me, and because the trouble is, people people they, so people write emails, then they send messages on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Some people send messages on Twitter, uh, and and there's just you know the gateways of communication are many and varied. So, so may I offer a public apology to anybody I haven't replied to that I owe a reply. Today was one of those days catching up with all the balls I've dropped. I have a confession to make, and nobody in this program is above reproach, and especially me, the producer, the guy who presses the red record button, and the guy who publishes it to YouTube. I'm not above reproach. Last week during the show, I was on pain pills, pills oh, I can't talk, pain pills because of the accent I had with the SUV and my bicycle. So when I went to type out the title and I used virtual instead of virtue, that was all me. That wasn't these guys. These guys know their English and grammar very well. So if you were virtually signaled, I'm sorry. It was supposed to be virtue. And uh, I mean, although I virtually is not that bad. I don't think you need to apologize. Huh. I thought you were being intensely intelligent and multidimensional. Oh. And I thought, here is Kevin introducing a totally new concept of, of signaling virtue in virtual reality. <laughs> oh, I thought this was multi-layered, sophisticated, and I just looked at you with new admiration. No, it was 600 milligrams of ibuprofen. <laughs> That's all it was. Uh, George, did I read you get another puppy? Well, it's... Uh We've had uh, more additions to the Conger household. Now that the children are off in California and Seattle, my wife is uh, collecting more bodies to bring home. And she brought home a golden retriever about 10 days ago that was a rescue. And the dog hated me, hated men. It would growl, wouldn't stay in the room with me, would attack our cats. And, and I said to my wife, I don't think this is a good idea. And we were able to find another home for the dog because it loves little old ladies. And we have a rather large number of little old ladies here in Florida. Well, while I'm uh, lying, while I'm awaking from the anesthesia, my wife had dropped me off and taken my wallet and the checkbook and all this. 
while I'm on there, and I come back, and she says, I, and she said, I just want you to know, I just bought a dog. <laughs> I put two hundred dollars down on a puppy that we'll get in eight weeks. It was born last night. So, uh, the, my wife knows that if I get, I know that if I get rid of a dog, my wife, when I'm unconscious under anesthesia with tubes and rods going in and all these places, to take the checkbook and spend because there's not much I can do to stop it. Could have been a car. <laughs> Thank God it was just a dog. Uh, okay, so this week. Um, some of the critics of the show have been highlighted to me and uh, brought to my attention. And I thought we would talk a little bit about Anglican Unscripted, our mission, and our response to our critics. Anglican Unscripted is designed to be an informative, fun show where we shine light into darkness, where we try to encourage the church, where we try to hold the church accountable for going astray, and where we try to as best as possible, show you guys WYSIWYG, what Christians are really like. When you see Kevin here on screen, this is what I'm like, whether I'm at church, whether I'm, uh, well, actually, when I'm in a business meeting signing a big contract, I wear my suit. Uh, what, but, you know, this is what, what you see is what you get. This is Kevin. That's George. There is no other George. He doesn't act any different anywhere else. And the same with Gavin. Uh, Gavin doesn't uh, uh, click off the camera and all of a sudden uh, become more English. No, he's just Gavin Winsome, well, George well, Winsome, and Kevin Winsome. This is who we are. And we want to convey that relationship as well as part of the, the news that we cover. And so when people are critical of the, of the show, I want to acknowledge, yeah, there's parts of the show you probably don't like. Um, we are tough on those who are in, in high leadership roles in the church who are going astray or who are uh, sometimes wolves in sheep's clothing like Catherine Jefford Shorey. We w want to hold them accountable because that's the nature of the gospel, to shine light on darkness. But when uh, George was poking around, what he discovered was that, that people suspect us of bad motivation. Yeah. And that, that's quite an important issue, isn't it, George? Yeah, I, I'm added to Facebook groups, and uh, I have about four or 5,000 friends on Facebook, of whom I know maybe about a dozen. Uh, three people I went to college with, my children, my wife, and uh, you, you two. Uh, <laughs> this is a dog you can add now, too. But yeah, go on. <laughs> and, no, but I mean, I enjoy that, and it's fun to interact, and uh, I don't mind. But usually I don't really post uh, personal observations of things. Uh, it's just not what I do. But one of these groups I was added to, I started reading through it, and I found there were some very harsh criticisms, uh, in particular of Gavin and myself. Uh, the criticisms of Gavin was that he was frustrated in his ambitions that because he's not a bishop in the Church of England, he's essentially a failure in life. And therefore, his mm -hmm. criticisms of Justin Welby and the Church of England are all driven by animus. And the criticisms of me was that I'm an angry uh, American. I'm just a nasty, nasty man. And that I just enjoy saying harsh, negative things because my character is is such that I take pleasure in causing pain. And the choke of it is that this is actually the exact opposite of who Gavin is and who I am. Uh, the We have a perennial, it's almost, it's irritating, I know, to Kevin and Gavin. But after a show concludes, I go, oh, no, I shouldn't have said that. That was so mean. I don't know if... Can we redo this? Um, but it's it's fascinating to see how the world sees you. I was a critic for a, a, a website called Get Religion for a number of years, about seven or eight years. And Get Religion is uh, basically the website you go to for professional criticism by reporters of other reporters, and it focused on religion. And I had to stop because in my heart, I just could not continue to criticize other people for silly mistakes, for dumb mistakes. I mean, it was no problem for malice, but 99% of the mistakes made by reporters are ignorance and silliness. And when I criticize the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, I do so not because I dislike the man or I'm envious of the man or any of these things that are uh, placed against me, but I just have such a deep sadness because I think he knows better, but has chosen a path 
of short-term least resistance rather than the path and the trial that he's been given, which is to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, it's not my place to tell him how to live his life, and it's hurtful for me to uh, ascribe bad motives to him, but... And so I, I ask apology for that because I have no no way of reading his mind. But the Don't actions say, taken are not those of a leader whom I would like to see in, at lead, speaking for Christendom. George, sometimes you do indeed say, I shouldn't have spoken in such a forthright way. And both Kevin and I say, oh, yes, you should. That was great. You were telling the truth. You really hit the bell at the fair with the hammer. And one of the things that both Kevin and I know and anyone else knows is, is that the outside of this you are you are nothing but 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 a gentle bear who who i mean you don't do anger it's not part of who you are i find the uh i find the, the low level anger you bring to some of the issues here very refreshing because to me it's a sign you're telling the truth now one of the things people who are listening you to you have to decide they have to decide whether or not the 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 critical energy you bring to this with your inf information is actually a badly formed character or whether it's something prophetically true and in a sense um, that's the people who listen are, are judged and what i'm afraid of is that this group of people who dislike us both <laughs> um, the fact they don't get what is being done is as much a reflection on them uh, as as they think their comments are on us i'm enormously grateful for the forthright way you speak and i don't see any crankiness in it at all it isn't about personal crankiness it's it's about a rage for a despoiled church. We, we're, 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 we're profoundly upset by what's happened to our Lord's body. And, and if I can say for a moment in my own defense, if defense is needed, um, when I was uh, um, invited to, to be ordained by the church, they offered to send me to, to Oxford and Cambridge to, do, to become a theologian. And I said, the problem is I've been involved with the church since I was six. And I'm, I said, I'm a bit underwhelmed by the clergy I've met. And if I'm going to be a Christian in the Church of England, I don't want to be seduced by the establishment. So is there a theological college which is where, where people go who are not interested in being seduced by the establishment? And they say, well, there's a very, there's a very hillbilly one <laughs> on the edge of London. Nobody will take any notice of you if you go there called Oak Hill. So I, I, it, it's improved since then. So I, I went to Oak Hill and they were right. No one took any notice of me. I, 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 um, I think that... Uh, am I am I inspired? Am I am I upset by not being a bishop of the Church of England? In fact, I'm I'm enormously grateful. When I look at the responsibilities of those who take responsibility for for the, what the church has become, I, I just couldn't do it. Uh, I, I as it happens after 35 years, I, I I think the ordination of women is not the freeing of women into ministry, which I profoundly agree with. Uh, it is it is the beginning of a process of the the missexualization of the church. I, I think gay marriage, which I was in favor of for a while, is actually the next stage of of that. Now, to, to to have responsibility in the Church of England, you have to be signed up to this progressive agenda. And I couldn't do it, so I would have had to resign by now. What I've discovered is that um, although I do indeed sometimes feel a failure because I'm not at all a very good Christian, I have to repent all the time. Nonetheless, what God has put into my hand is a sign that he wants me to do what I'm doing. You, and one can't possibly feel a failure if, if the Lord uses one. And he, he only uses me in small things. It's just a matter of a two-line comment for the Daily Telegraph or, or for a news. It's not very much, but it's a huge privilege to be able to try and wipe some of the mess off the face of Christ. And well, I think uh, that's what we're doing. I want to give you the paradox here. According to the press of England, you are England's bishop. You are the one they go to for quotes. You are the one they seek, you know, what would a Christian think? They don't call Justin Welby. They don't call any other bishops. They call Gavin well, I, Ashington. I think they do, but, but, but the other bishops aren't allowed to respond. No, no bishop of the Church of England can speak beyond his brief. Um, but but they, they, they do call me, and it's ridiculous. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I have an online ministry, and I'm extremely grateful. I have a few clergy who look to me as their bishop, um, and, and, and we, we love each other very much. It's a small setup, but, but we're doing what we're doing with integrity. And I'm very, very grateful 
to be involved with Anglican Unscripted because what I've seen you and George do over the years is exactly what, what we've been saying, shine a light into the darkness and to try and hold the church to account, not in order to damage it further or to wound it, but actually to, in, to, to, to speak on behalf, yeah. well, on behalf of those who are offended by it and to encourage them in their own prophetic responses. And one of the things we see in the, in the comments is there are a number of people who care as deeply as we do for the healing of the church and, are in, and I'm so pleased to say are encouraged by what we say on our corporate behalf. I, I want to do it, George, this is a place for a transition. We Can do, I just? Yeah, well, quickly, sure. Well, the, the, the need, it's not complete. I mean, the, the problem with, in the sense of the press, the liberal, uh, the progressive agenda, the liberal agenda, whatever you wish to call it, is advancing so rapidly. We now have a politician uh, named Harriet Harman, who was a former cabinet minister in labor governments, who would like to be Speaker of the House of Commons. She is on record many, many times supporting the legalization of pedophilia of, of, and saying, isn't it terrible? They're born that way. They can't help it. We should accommodate their needs. We should lower the ages of consent. We should do all that we can to help these poor people. So the next cause We've moved from the ordination of women. We've moved to homosexuality. We've now moved into transgenderism. What's next? It's pedophilia. And, I, and I'm and i not even going to begin to guess what's after pedophilia. Bestiality. I know exactly what's next. Well, yeah, but, yes. but the point is that is this a conversation? In other words, nobody that I'm aware of is approaching Harriet Harman's comments and history on pedophilia from a moral ethical issue they're approaching it, oh, this won't play well with some core constituency voters. But nobody is sort of raising the way Gavin does when the press ask him, or as he does in his sermons, the moral, intellectual life issues that are facing the world today, especially in England. And uh, Gavin, and just, Kevin's point about Gavin being the bishop of George Carey was ridiculed by a journalist named Andrew Brown years ago because George Carey said that he in, aspired to be the, the, the parson, the parish priest for the people of England. And that was a noble uh, call on George Carey's part of to support, affirm, educate, teach the doctrines of Christianity. And he was attacked by Andrew Brown because, oh, who is this man with bad teeth and a bad accent from the East End? Uh, how could he possibly, how could this lower class scrub possibly uh, be, uh, be, uh, be my vicar? Um, so Gavin, who, without saying these words that George Carey said 30 years ago, is doing the actions that, so, that the Archbishop of Canterbury, that the bishops of the House of Church of England should be doing, of offering a moral platform on a wider scale. Okay, so enough about us. I want to move on to some news. Because believe it or not, a cathedral in England has done something absolutely asinine again. And I thought, you know, we've talked about it now for what, about a year, all the different things. Putt, putt, golf. Helter Skelters, uh, the list goes, oh, now we're going to add a London fashion show. Not only is this a cathedral, but this is the cathedral where Gavin was ordained. Gavin, you saw this wonderful, chic, stiletto type event going on in your cathedral where you uh, walked barefoot and were ordained. Uh, what were your thoughts? <laughs> so, uh, guys, please forgive me for my overt sign of piety in advance. Um, but when I was ordained, I remember thinking I should not be ordained in shoes. I should take my shoes off and be barefoot. Uh, something about Moses and the burning bush came to mind. And so my cassock was long enough to hide my feet. Nobody else saw. It was a private thing. I haven't mentioned it till now, 38 years later. <laughs> but but on, I, stood on those, I stood barefoot on those stones, and I asked God to forgive me for being such a lousy Christian in the, in the vague hope I could serve him as a priest. So these stones mattered to me, <laughs> and, and there, there was this, this. I guess I, it looked to me like I, I think it was animalistic. I looked, I looked at the fashion, and I thought, here were 
here were human beings who were more animal than angels. This is a C.S. Lewis phrase that I've yes, always found yes, very yes. helpful. That, that you know we we are invited to become more angelic. We don't get to be angels. We are the sons of the living God. But it, but it's it's kind of it's either angel or animal. And and in a very slinky, sexy, uh, um, but but dangerous way. Here were these models. Uh, flaunting is the right word themselves on stones that were intended to be holy that that I mean so we could argue about the extent to which buildings and matter is holy we've done that in the past but I did find this fashion show on these particular stones really upsetting and problematic but but you know, do they know what they're doing or do they not know what they're doing I, I think the Dean and the chapter don't know what they're doing no ignorance just like the the press and religion um, it, it's hard to watch. And then I read another story, and you commented on this in the press over. Uh, yeah. You want to cover it? No, no, I, I just want to push, push up. Gavin, explain to them what they're doing wrong, because let, let's just go through the thinking. We'll get the press here. We'll make some money. Our ASA perhaps, will go up. So, yeah, somebody <laughs> perhaps may come back a second time. Maybe they left their purse, uh, and so they'll come back to on Sunday to pick it up. That how could this and how could this be a lose losing situation? I think I think the answer is there are, there are two worldviews in in conflict here, and one worldview is if you like an inclusive worldview, a universalistic, which is everything is going to the right point and everyone will get there no matter what they do. This is a very attractive view of universalism, and there is another view which is exemplified in the Gospel of John above all. Uh, Zoroastrian is pretty big on it. It's one of the reasons why I like Zoroastrianism and see it as a precursor to our joint project. And the Gospel of John says, actually, with freedom of choice, there's going to be a division between those who accept what God offers to them and allow themselves to be reformed and enter into paradise and those, those who deny it and refuse it. And all the way through the, gospel, the, the Old Testament, we see people accepting or refusing and consequences all the time. Now, Origen, amongst others, said, yeah, in the end, God will make it all okay. And I don't know if he will or not. It's just that Jesus didn't talk like that. Jesus talked of an abiding gap in heaven and hell. So I'm a Christian, not, not an Originite, and I follow what Jesus said. And if Jesus is right, then one of the things the church needs to do is to work terribly hard to save people from going in the other direction. And, and the problem with hosting a fashion show in a very holy place is it sends out a message, a, a, a very articulate one, saying it doesn't matter how you live or what you do. Everyone's going to get to where we're going in the end. And I think that is, and if that was the case, Jesus didn't need to die. He didn't need to be rejected. He didn't need to suffer. He, he didn't need to, to, to cry out, I thirst on the cross. Or, or lama, lama sabachthani. Uh, which is Psalm 22, which starts off with dereliction but ends up with joy. None of that needs to have happened. Well, I really think these universalists have misunderstood what what Jesus came to do. And, and Ironically, we to, well, I want to just follow up. If universalism is true, then Jesus was never even resurrected. It's not that he didn't have to die. He was never resurrected, if any of the, what they say is true. And this mindset that we, I believe, this mindset we see portrayed at the Southern Cathedral and the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City every so often. Elton John once gave a concert uh, there that was just as wild and uh, flaunty, vul vulgar. Um, <laughs> we have an American version of this heresy that has spread now to Africa, and that's the prosperity gospel, mm. which is that we have a contractual relationship with God which is if we give money, if we say our, if we have faith, if we say our prayers, God will make us wealthy and give us phys uh, give us physical uh, health, and that God's will is for there to be no suffering in this life. Jesus took upon Himself your sufferings, but you do not have to pick up your cross and follow Him because Christ has done it all for you. And if you say the right words, it's over. It's done. And in other words, it's this destruction of the whole understanding of sin and repentance and new birth regeneration in Jesus Christ that's going on at Southern Cathedral, that's going on on the Joel Osteen TV shows. It's uh, 40 years ago, Fitzsimmons Allison of Bishop of South Carolina wrote a wonderful book called The Cruelty of Heresy. And the word I want to focus on is mm -hmm. cruelty, because there's nothing new under the sun about what's happening at Southern Cathedral with the Fashion Week. And, and where Gavin's bare feet are now replaced by stiletto heels 
on in, on the in these sacred precincts. And that's just the dean. <laughs> <laughs> but for, but Sorry. For the, don't you know who the dean is? <laughs> oh my! But the but the cruelty is is that these te- So the question is, my question to Gavin in our pre-show is, does the dean know? what he's doing and just is taking a short-term road of accommodation or is he truly ignorant and, Ga- and gavin's response is ignorance um and this I, one don't, I don't know the which name. is cruel well ignorance can be cruel well yeah. the cruelty, the cruelty is that it is leading people into damnation mm-hmm. that and they this- are not going to know the risen lord jesus christ and their souls will be lost for eternity and that is the cruelty of heresy it's evil I- and and this is one of the reasons why why we're trying to speak out against it because um not everyone has has has, has done uh as much theological thinking as as they should have done and and we're faced with two issues i mean so the the two uh, forces that are crushing christianity between them are are a virtue a version of secularism um with its the train crash that George described with these four carriages, but also universalism driving it. And on the other hand, Islam. And so one of the reasons why we're speaking out is because people don't get the implications uh, of these two movements. And so you know, we've had, as Kevin will no doubt remind us, an issue of the Quran being read in another in another cathedral in Abbey this week. Well, we talked about it being read, I think it was you know, a replacement for the gospel in the cathedral last time. What what uh, church was that at? Go at the Glasgow controversy. They yeah, have the, a national, <laughs> national notice. For. Yeah, that made you famous. Um, now that happened about two years ago. Now we have again a Quran being read uh, uh, during a funeral service. My point is, they're treating it like Shakespeare, like it's just another reading. They don't treat it like you know the anti-Christian narrative that it is. Am they're I treating- wrong? Almost like the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, which yeah. is a piece of Persian poetry I, uh, I used to, to love. Um, in, this isn't as bad as, as the reading at the Epiphany in Glasgow, which I think was that was literally blasphemous. Mm-hmm. A, a piece of the Quran that says Jesus didn't rise again. Um, th- this was a kind of multicultural political event where um, Paddy Ashdown, Lord Ashdown, died. As George was reminding us in the pre-show, he was very much involved in the Balkans, uh, and as part of a way of um, expressing his kaleidoscopic tastes and experience, they brought in an imam from Sarajevo to read the Quran. Why did? Why does this matter? At one level, this looks like a rather nice, uh, inclusive, multi-layered, multicultural event for a sophisticated man, and it is that. It's true, but but the Abbey stands for something else. It isn't. Um, George, I hope you don't mind me quoting you from earlier on. George said, "Well, it's you know, it's not a multi-faith chaplaincy centre, <laughs> but that's how they that's how they're treating it." The problem I put something on the on Twitter and said the problem with the Quran is it calls Jesus out as a liar, you know, because Jesus rose from the dead, said he was going to, and they said he didn't. Someone quite rightly held me to task and said, "No, no, that's not what Muslims say. Jesus is a prophet. They say the Bible is lying." So that's true. More accurately, the Quran says Matthew, Mark, yeah. Luke, John, and St. Paul are all lying. Well, it's not quite as bad, but it's very nearly as bad. Now, the, the difficulty is if you treat a piece of literature with respect and, and give it affirmation and a pride of place in your own liturgical tradition, even if it's at a funeral, you are implicitly validating it if you don't say anything else. I mean, if you were to say, for example, we, we, do, we reject what the Quran says about the Gospels being unreliable, but nonetheless, there are some nice bits in it, and we find this quite pleasing. I could almost accept that. <laughs> I think it would be a mistake, but I, I could see it. But they don't see that. And many Christians have no idea how deadly the Quran is about the biblical witness to the resurrection of Jesus. And so if we just say nothing and say and accept our Christian colleagues and peers introducing little bits of the Quran into services on a multicultural basis, what we're doing is we're providing the way for for, for affirming the Quranic narrative. Because the less we complain, the less we say about it, the more the impression is gained in people's minds that actually the Bible and the Quran are, are, uh, are, are mutually affirmative 
and it doesn't really matter. We're back to this universalism again. Actually, ask a Muslim whether there's a heaven or a hell, and he'll tell you absolutely there is. So the, the paradox is by involving Islam inclusively, you then say to them, is, is an inclusive universalistic view the right way of looking at the universe? And they'll say, no, you're going to hell. <laughs> I can't I think, think, well, hold on. I, want, I can't think of one mosque on the planet Earth that would allow the Gospel of John, Mark, Luke, or Matthew to be read at their services. Am I wrong? No, you're right. It's like someone in West. Someone asked Westminster Abbey. They said, "You know, did you have this reading? Yes. Do this often? Yes, we do. Why do you do it? Uh, well, because it's hospitable. Uh, can you then please tell us whether or not there's any mutual mutual reciprocal arrangement with mosques? Uh, we'll have to get back to you. No, they didn't need to. There was Don't a rhetorical worry. question. There is none whatsoever. George, uh, I think we. I think though we should sort of qualify what we're saying. That I have a neighbor. Uh, the village of Micanopy, an Episcopal church there, every year has a three-faith uh, uh, forum where they have a Muslim, a Jewish, and a Christian speaker speak about their faiths in the church, but not in the t context of liturgical worship. I think it's wonderful to have these faiths where you have people expressing the, what they understand their faith to be teaching in that sort of forum, at, even though it's taking place in a church. The line I'm drawing and the line uh, I think that we all agree on is that when it moves into the context of Christian liturgy and worship, when we pull into the Christian worship readings from the Quran. Now, if Patty Ashdown's funeral were held at the interfaith chaplaincy at Heathrow Airport, I'd have no problem about that. But the problem is that this is a building set aside to the glory of God and its dean doesn't seem to feel that there are any lines or boundaries between Christianity and any faith expression. Yeah. So I, what I, is so what so why is Westminster Abbey still a church? Why has it not been completely made a temple of ethical culture? Which is what it is. Yeah, that's when what it's it has been this planet, way of doing yeah. things. And the really interesting question, the, the 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 nuclear bomb that's waiting just down the road, when the Queen dies. Uh, and, and, and Muslims say, we're now quite a large proportion of the population. And if you're going to have a coronation, uh, and it's going to be in Westminster Abbey, we'd like more of the Quran read, please. And we'd like some Islamic elements of spirituality incorporated into this new monarchical event to represent the fact that we're here. Now, in, in Christian terms, this isn't possible. In terms of a kind of universalistic, relativistic religion, smorgasbord, well, of course you do. But th that would be one more departure from Christian witness I, th I think King to be Prince Charles would allow it. Well, we we don't know. He's that he, he's a very mixed up figure. He we must give him credit for speaking out for persecuted Christians in the Middle East. He has done that. He, he did but... go through the Islamic stage. It's true, but but uh, you know, I think this we're, we're preparing, we're rehearsing for what is likely to be an immense a moment of immense constitutional problem. Mm. Uh, when, when the Queen dies. And this question has to be faced by the people who put together the coronation and work out on what basis monarchy happens and on what basis coronation happens and, in Westminster Abbey, the Christian centre. And where I chide the leadership of the Church of England is that they're doing no prep work. Yeah, exactly. In yeah. other words, this is going to happen five years, ten years, whenever it does happen. And the, and the work needs to be done now. Why the Church needs to lay out why the exclusive claims of Christianity and the Queen's or the King to be's role as protector of the faith. If that work is not done now, they're going to lose the conversation uh, 10 years hence. Or, George, I suspect you've lost the already. Question, the question has been asked do they even want to fight this battle? Well, I, I, th I was going to go a stage further and. and much though I dislike conspiracy theories, they may be doing the preparation work now. They may have already decided the battle is lost and they're going with the flow. And one of the reasons why the Dean of Westminster Abbey is willing to have the Quran read is because they need to prepare the population for an interfaith monarchy. Can I uh, in, in interject something that um, if that happens, the Anglican communion is over because the uh, the role of the Archbishop of Canterbury will be, he will be dethroned as first among equals. Correct. Because the, that, that is the line that the developing world will not, 
not tolerate. They can close their eyes to homosexuality because it's not happening here, and that's just, we always thought the English were a little odd, but when it goes to that line, that'll be the end. And we've had a precursor of this. Josiah Wadawa Faron, who's the head of the Anglican Consultative Council, he uh, is a scholar of Islam. He was always an outlier in the Church of Nigeria. And he, the, the ACC does some really un vulgar things. They call him an archbishop. Well, he was demoted. He was an archbishop of a province and then lost re-election and returned to, he had, it's as if you were a temporary general and then returned to the rank of colonel and retires a colonel. You don't call yourself general. Well, Arch, uh, Adaiwu Furon went to the consecration of the new archbishop of South Sudan, Justin Badiaman. And at this service, he read a passage from the Quran to the assembled bishops. Gosh. And the bishops there were so livid, so angry, that they even reached out to me. Do you remember, Kevin, we published statements of how livid, and now, let me put it this way, the African culture is you don't really, unless you either kill the chief so that you can become chief, or you yeah. obey the chief. Yeah, that's it. You don't it's say nothing. Not like, it's yeah. not like America or England where you can complain all you want about the man at top and nobody cares. You don't say anything against the man at top. And the Sudanese, South Sudanese bishops were so livid because they had gone through 25 years of civil war with an Islamist government in, in Khartoum that Josiah Daewoo Faron, in a tip to multiculturalism, in a tip to show his sensitivities to the presence of Muslims in the area, gave a reading from the Quran at a South Sudan consecration at the cathedral in Juba. So that has already happened. So when it happens in Westminster, and when it happens in Westminster Abbey, this will basically end any semblance that the Church of England has any position as a Christian body within the greater Anglican communion. Now, I'm sure the church in Wales don't won't worry about it, but no. I'm talking about the larger communion. Larger but communion. I mean, there's there's Plan B, which is GAFCON, you know, but the communion itself, poof. Well, I'd just like to take it a step further and say that one of the reasons why this matters is that that that, that Islamic culture has not produced the the freedom uh, and the energy, the creative energy that, that Christendom has. I've been very up that's not the right word. I've been very interested in the way in which Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale, the sequel's just coming out. I didn't pay enough attention when The Handmaid's Tale came out. I saw all these women in, in, in um, Puritan clothing, uh, as, as people probably know in her novel, she foresaw a, an apocalyptic America where uh, women were forced into a particular form of clothing and turned into sex slaves. I didn't realize at the time that Margaret Atwood was actually writing about Islam. Um, but in fact, which she was, but the critics, the media turned it into attack on Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so, so still, because there is no sense of the implications that, that the proper trajectory of Islam is actually Saudi Arabia or Tehran, as it is now, uh, and that people will lose their freedom of speech, their freedom of action, uh, and their freedom of conscience, because they are not exemplified in Islamic cultures. Um, it, the, the people who ought to be saying this are, is, is the Christian church, uh, the, the, the people who are the guardians of, of, of the repository of Jesus. And the fact that they're not is one of the reasons why our culture is, is dying a death and likely to get wiped out. It really it matters enormously. One of the things that I find just so appalling from and as an outsider, it's, it's more sad than me than upsetting. Uh, well, Tommy Robinson was just released from prison. He was serving uh, a short sentence for a civil uh, crime of uh, videotaping. Uh, video uh, he defied a court order. Mm -hmm. He was sent to Belmarsh Prison, which is the maximum security prison in England. It's like going to the Supermax prison in uh, Colorado, where we have the 9-11 uh, bombers and the uh, uh, John Gotti before he was dead. I mean, it, it is a place that is really hardcore. And he was put into this because they couldn't. The, the, that was the only prison that could guarantee his that, that he would live through his imprisonment. And while he was in prison, he only ate tin tuna, where he opened the cans of tuna because he could not eat the food from the prison cafeteria because Muslim prisoners would attempt to poison it. He had to be segregated, and he had no. He had 
his bar cells were covered up because Muslim prisoners would throw theses at him as they would walk past. And this is the culture of the British prisons is high pressure Islam. And it's starting there. And here we have a political prisoner. I'll, I'll say something that are that those people who dislike us because we're mean Americans and failed failed bishops will will latch onto it because Tommy Robinson is the third rail. It's poison. You can't mention his name. But for an American, this is a political prisoner who says unpopular things and is jailed by the establishment, and the establishment can't protect him from Islam, who wants to kill him. This is where this is where England is going, and I. I hate to sound melodramatic, but there's going to come a time, excuse me, I'm going to use slang, where the men in the white vans are basically going to say, I've had enough. That, you know, the, the working class Englishmen are basically going to say, this is not my country anymore. This is not my government. These people in power, the elites, the, the police, the, 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 the clergy do not have my interests at heart. I'm the enemy. I think it doesn't take too long to go look at our history. Afghanistan of the 70s was a peaceful nation. Men and women walked the streets free. They didn't have to wear headscarves and uh, costumes of Islam. Uh, they were not uh, rounded up like cat. The women were not rounded up like cattle and uh, forced to marry. Um, Things have changed under Islamic revolutions. It was you know? a hippie destination to go buy uh, opium. It was, we had all these uh, European and yeah. American teenagers flitting out to Afghanistan in the early 70s to yeah. buy drugs. I, I've been invited into some fairly high-level discussions about the, the trajectory of the things you've talked about, and I, I don't want to talk about them on air. I think it'd be unhelpful. And anyway, it, it takes me into a political arena in which I don't feel I have a commission to speak. Sure. I do have a commission to speak on, on in Christian terms, and 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 I think I, I wish there was some way in which we could bring Christian leadership in this country back to a clear sense of the virtues of Christianity and of Jesus, and the, the disadvantages of allowing Islamic influence to take over. Essentially, the clearest way of doing it is to compare Jesus and Muhammad as figures. But, but there is no sense in this country that our Christian leaders can throw off this, this hobbling, crippling universalism that is behind the fashion show in Southwark Cathedral uh, and, and evangelistically proclaim the virtues of Jesus and the Christian faith. And because they can't, and because the Muslims are much more committed to Muhammad and the Quran than the Christians appear to be committed to Jesus and the Bible, the future is, is, is grim. Gentlemen, 42 minutes. Even I would have trouble sitting through Unscripted for 42 minutes. So I want to thank the people who've stuck with us for so long. We know that's an entertaining show, an informative show. It's a fun show to do. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 300, 534 of Anglican Unscripted. And for those of you who think we're miserable, we look forward enormously to the coming of Christ the King and see you in heaven, if not before. Mm -hmm.